She is the queen of the skies. Since 1969, the Boeing 747 flies through the heavens around the globe. For some, it is the most beautiful aircraft ever built. But now, 53 years after Boeing first started its production, the last 747 is about to roll off the assembly line. After that, the era of this beautiful aircraft will slowly end. Why, you ask? Well, that's the topic of today's video. You see, it's not just the 747's time coming to a slow end, but also the one of, for example, the Airbus A380. So why aren't you seeing any new planes with four engines being manufactured? Let's find out in this video. Welcome to Airspace. First, let's go back in time to the beginning of the age of aviation, because that's where we'll find our answer eventually. Back in 1919, two brave men by the name of John Alcock and Arthur Brown set out on a daring adventure. They intended to fly their twin-engine Vickers Vimy, a modified First World War bomber, all the way from St. John's in Newfoundland, over the Atlantic to Ireland. Should they succeed, they would be the first men to successfully cross the Atlantic non-stop. A brave venture, for sure. Airplanes were not the most reliable means of transport back then, and mechanical failures in flight were definitely not unheard of, but rather the norm. But against all odds, Alcock and Brown made it and landed at Clifton in Western Ireland 16 hours after their departure. Their adventure had not been without its misfortunes, though. At one point, the aviators had to fly through thick fog. Since they did not have any instruments showing them the attitude of their plane, they quickly became disoriented and lost control of the aircraft not once, but twice. Miraculously, Alcock managed to come back to stable flight conditions both times. Upon arrival in Ireland, the two men picked what they believed was a nice green field as their landing spot. Unfortunately, what they saw was not a field, but a very muddy bog. When they finally touched down, their plane's wheels stuck into the ground and the aircraft nosed over. It was rather heavily damaged, but the pilots walked away unscathed toward their hero's welcome. After this first non-stop flight, many more would follow, in increasingly larger aircraft carrying more and more passengers. But still, aviation was in its infancy and reliability of engines and planes was lackluster. Therefore, the Bureau of Air Commerce, the precursor to today's Federal Air Administration or FAA, had to take action to protect passengers. In 1936, it decreed that flights had to remain within 100 miles or 60 minutes of flight time to the next airport a plane could land at. You see, back then, engine failures were rather common. It was therefore not too unreasonable to ask pilots to stay close to an airfield so that they could land if one of their engines failed. It would take decades until this rule was loosened somewhat. In 1953, the FAA accepted planes with more than two engines from the 60-minute rule which enabled aircraft with three or four engines to fly further from a suitable airport. The reasoning behind this was that one engine failure was somewhat rare, but still not unheard of at the time, but two simultaneous engine failures were rather unlikely. If a plane could still fly reliably with two engines out, then by all means, it could do so even far away from airports. This version of the 60-minute rule still stands today for most short-haul aircraft like the Boeing 737 or the Airbus A320 in their standard versions. The waiver of the 60-minute rule for aircraft with three or more engines came more or less at the same time than the advent of the jet age. In the 60s, beautiful planes like the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar and the DC-10 were developed. As you can see, these aircraft sport three jet engines and were therefore exempt from the 60-minute rule, making them a prime choice for airlines at the time. Now you might wonder, why are these 60 minutes so important? You see, normally when flying over populated land masses like Europe or North America, there is an abundance of airports to land at and the compliance with the 60-minute rule requires little to no planning. But what if somebody wanted to get from Europe to the United States or vice versa? One would have to cross the Atlantic Ocean. As you can see, it is pretty vast and devoid of populated areas, save for a few islands. It is possible to cross this vastness while staying within 60 minutes of an alternate airport, but it is pretty inefficient. Pilots cannot take a direct route between Paris and New York, for example. No, they would have to fly all the way up here, using airports like Stornoway in Scotland, Reykjavik in Iceland, Kulusuk and Nuuk in Greenland, 
Iqaluit in northern Canada, and from there on back to more populated areas in Canada and the United States. These airports are small and are often plagued by terrible weather, not only during the winter months. Therefore, airlines were very keen on using planes with more than two engines to forego the 60-minute rule in favor of a much more efficient and direct route over the ocean. For years, this dominance of tri- and quad-jet planes prevailed, until aircraft manufacturers discovered that jet engines became more and more reliable. Engine failures had become a rarity towards the end of the 1970s. In 1976, the Airbus A300 received permission to fly up to 90 minutes away from alternate airports instead of just 60. A few years later, in 1980, Boeing's Director of Engineering approached the Director of the FAA, Johnny Lynn Helms, about the possibility of an exemption. In essence, he asked if Boeing could manufacture a plane with only two engines that would be exempt from the dreaded 60-minute rule. The Director's famous response was, it'll be a cold day in hell before I let twins fly long-haul overwater routes. By twins, he of course meant planes with two jet engines. Still, Boeing kept pushing and by 1985, they had finally softened the FAA enough to allow them to fly their newly developed Boeing 767-200 further away from a diversion airport. The new rule allowed the two-engine 767 to stray up to 120 minutes or two hours away from the next safe landing possibility. And thus, an acronym was conceived. An acronym that would change the shape and design of planes forever and would one day spell the end of the Boeing 747 and the Airbus A380. This acronym is ETOPS, which is short for Engines Turn or Passenger Swim, which is exactly what passengers would do if both engines of a two-engine aircraft were to fail over the Atlantic Ocean. Wait, what's that? I, I can't lie to people on the internet. Oh, well okay, here's the less fun but more true version of the term. ETOP stands for Extended Range Twin Engine Operations Performance Standards. There you have it, it's a lot less fun, but oh well. The introduction of the ETOP standard was a boon for airlines. The newer aircraft with only two engines were a lot more efficient than their predecessors. For example, a Boeing 767 burned about 3.2 tons or 7,000 pounds of fuel less per hour than a Lockheed TriStar on the same route. For a transatlantic crossing, that amounts to fuel savings in the order of about 22.5 tons or 50,000 pounds. A substantial amount. In addition to that, the newer aircraft were cheaper to maintain, since only two, not three or four engines had to be cared for and overhauled. Soon after, more two-engine, ETOPS compliant aircraft were released, such as the Airbus A310. With the rise of twin jets, planes with three engines slowly started to disappear. The 1980s saw further progress in engine manufacturing and eventually, the FAA created a new category of ETOPS, ETOPS 180, which would allow pilots to fly up to three hours away from a suitable alternate airport. This new qualification was subject to very stringent technical and operational qualifications. The original regulation allowed new aircraft to be certified to a maximum of 120 minutes upon their release to airlines. Only after they demonstrated a year of trouble-free flight, they would be granted the prestigious ETOPS 180 status. With ETOPS 180, about 95% of the Earth's surface is covered. For transatlantic flights, this means that usually only two or maybe a maximum of three alternate airports is needed. For airlines and dispatchers plying flight routes, this is very practical. You see, these airports right here are among the ones that are most frequently used by ETOPS flight over the Atlantic Ocean. Airports in Greenland are only sometimes used since they offer challenging weather, terrain and runways. Now, with this selection of airports, we can draw circles around them that correspond to a flight time of 3 hours. As long as these circles overlap, planning requirements are fulfilled. You can see here that this allows for a pretty straightforward flight planning, since it is sufficient to have just one alternate airport on each side of the Atlantic, for example, Shannon and Gander. The size of the circles also allows for a greater flexibility in the case that one airport is unavailable due to bad weather. In winter, flights are frequently planned using the airport of Lages in the Azores, which often has a lot better weather conditions than its snowy northern counterparts. This very efficient flight planning allows for pretty much direct flights between Northern America and Europe, if you see flights that are not taking the most direct route, that will usually only be because the winds may be more favorable a bit further north or south. To allow for this lenient planning with alternate airports few and far between, very strict rules have to be adhered to in many departments. 
For one, the aircraft systems must be built in a very redundant way, so that a failure of one system does not prompt a plane to diverge in most cases. Also, maintenance work is highly regulated. For example, no single mechanic may work on both engines of a given plane to reduce the possibility of human error. Today, ETOPS is commonplace and flights are using the rule all over the globe every single day. With the development of even more reliable engines, new ETOPS certifications have been made possible. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner has an ETOPS rating of 330 minutes or 5 hours and 30 minutes, and the Airbus A350 even sports an ETOPS 370 qualification, allowing for a whopping 6 hours and 10 minutes of flight time on one engine to the next airport. To put that in perspective, this covers 99.7% of the Earth's surface and allows the A350 to fly directly from anywhere to anywhere in the world, except directly over the South Pole. To maintain these very impressive certifications, Boeing and Airbus must prove that their engines are hyper-reliable. Just one engine incident per 100,000 hours of operation is allowed. Now, let's come back to the beginning of the video. Why is ETOPS responsible for the slow but certain phase-out of four-engine aircraft? The answer is simple. Newer aircraft are just a lot more efficient. Newer engines consume less fuel, and two engines usually consume a lot less fuel than four. Also, maintenance costs are tremendously lower if only two and not four engines have to be maintained. Thanks to ETOPS rules, jets with two engines can now fly any route a plane with four engines can. In an age where jet fuel is expensive and concerns for the environment are at an understandable high, efficiency is key. It just does not make too much economical and ecological sense anymore to operate an aircraft with four engines if a cheaper and more efficient alternative is available. So there you have it. Aviation really has come a long way since its heyday, back when daring aviators tried to make their way through fog, wind, weather and snow in 1919. Let me know your thoughts on this video. Do you feel safe flying over the ocean in a plane that has just two engines? I'm excited for your comments. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe so we can get the channel ever closer to 100,000 subscribers. If you'd like to support the channel more permanently, check out my Patreon. The link is in the description and in the pinned comment below this video. Thank you very much and see you all in the next one.